Good afternoon, friends. Welcome to CEC Edusit Live Lecture, dear friends. In this session today, uh, we are going to talk on one of the most important topics. You might have heard about uh, quality assurance and uh, quality control. So, dear friends, in that context, today we are going to study how uh, quality assurance and uh, quality control. Um, these two terms are used uh, when we talk about uh, monitoring air and uh, when we talk about measurement of air, specifically in context to the uh, environmental related issues and for this uh, we have with us in our studios uh, Dr. Arun Srivastav. Dr. Srivastav um, is Assistant Professor in School of Environmental Sciences uh, JNU. So first of all I would like to welcome our guest Dr. Srivastav and I hope that the way he used to deliver his lectures uh, with uh, lots of examples. Uh, this lecture is also going to be one of the finest lectures. So welcome to the Edisit lecture sir. Uh, you, first sir. of all I would like to know through you what basically quality assurance and uh, quality control are when we talk about uh, measuring measuring the or monitoring the air well uh, you know air pollution we had been discussing and we had I think we ha I had taken some classes on uh, this air pollution but while those who are either in the <coughs> monitoring uh, uh, monitoring site I mean they are their duties to monitor or report and those who are in the research field they often monitor air quality monitor air pollution but they often forget the quality assurance and air is a very uncertain thing as far as its, uh, uh, its concentration is concerned in space and time, it is highly variable. Apart from that, these two things, there are many other factors which deviate the concentration of air in space and time. So we often forget and we always uh, do not care about these things that air, the quality what we observe as far as the pollution is concerned, its quality should be controlled and <coughs> its, qu its quality should be assured. Apart from that, one more important thing is that if we do not do all these, if we do not follow these practices like quality assurance and quality control and if there is some problem in the instrument, this instrument <coughs> or the method if we are adopting a wrong procedure or wrong method or if we are using a faulty instrument, so there is a possibility that the result or the data of what we are obtaining will always be wrong and continuously it will be wrong. So, the decision or the information what we will gather afterwards that is not going to be of any use or not going to be of much use as far as policy is concerned or as far as the research outputs are concerned. So, today we will discuss the quality, how we can control the quality and <coughs> quality in the monitoring of air and its measurement. As far as the quality assurance and quality control are concerned, there are two different things. We often confuse to both of them to be same, but they are in fact different. Quality assurance basically represents the process, whether the process is correct or not. If we are to obtain something, whether it is a product or whether it is a data or whether it is a result, so the process or the procedure what we are adopting, if it is faulty, if it is not correct, then we will say that quality is not assured. And the control is the process, control is the <coughs> thing which we apply for the end product or about the result. If the end product or the result what we are obtaining is not correct, then we will say that quality is not controlled. So quality assurance and quality control, uh, these are two different things. One is associate, associated with the process or processes what we are applying, another is associated with the <coughs> end product or the result what we get. Similarly, there is some more differences. In fact, quality assurance aims to prevent defects with a focus on the process used to make the products. So, we can say that it is a proactive quality process while quality control aims to identify and correct defects in the finished product, the obtained product. So, we can say quality control is a reactive process. The previous one was a proactive process while the later one is a reactive process. Similarly, <coughs> if there is a problem so, how we can verify or how we can detect it? So, for that we apply some verification method, either it could be some technique associated with the instrument or associated with the processes. Similarly, if con quality control is not correct, uh, I mean it is faulty, then we have to validate it with the help of 
software testings, etc. This is how we can control the quality. Uh, we can control quality and uh, we can assure the quality and control the quality. Now, suppose if we are going for observation or measurement, so we will have to find uh, follow some steps. These are like that. First one is observation and measurement. Means, first of all, we do some observation, we do some measurement and then with the help of that, this observed and measured value with the help of verification, we get data and then data is tested, data is tested, afterward the tested data, if it is correct, gives us information. Next one, information with the help of interpretation of those informations, we get knowledge and afterwards the knowledge with, with the help of comprehensive interpretation, we get understanding and later on with the judgment of that understanding, we get wisdom. So, this is the step how we move forward from the observation or measurement to up to measurement. So, these are in fact seven different steps. Now, <clears throat> so we can see here along x axis whatever is what we whatever we are doing <coughs> here the subjectivity is important i mean whether it is <coughs> observation obtaining data information or knowledge or understanding these are related to the subjectivity i mean for this we will have to be dependent upon some kind of system or some kind of methods whether it is an instrument or whether it is some technique whilst along y axis we are saying it is an increasing human value. It means like the examples of verification, testing, interpretations, comprehensive interpretations and judgment. Here humans interpretation or humans involvement is important. So along x axis we are dependent upon something whether it is an instrument or it is a technique whilst along y axis whatever is there, here the human value or human mind is more important. Similarly, <coughs> whenever we are obtaining data, what could be our objectives that is data quality objectives. First of all, we will have to clarify the study subject, what we will have to study. In this particular case, it is air pollution. So, the next one is we will have to define the most appropriate data of uh, appropriate type of data which has to be collected. Now, suppose this air pollution might be having different type of, I mean, this, this data can be collected by different methods uh, diff uh, on different basis. It could be an hourly data, it could be uh, daily data, it could be weekly data, it could be monthly data or it could be annual data. So, the next one is we will have to define or we will have to identify which one is most suitable for any particular study or in a particular condition. Let it be either it is daily or it is weekly or so on. Similarly, then we will have to define the most appropriate condition from which the data could be collected. Condition means its surroundings or its height, different variables. Like if the collection of data is most appropriate in summer or it is most appropriate in winter or it is most appropriate in monsoon season. So, the next one is we will have to uh, identify which condition is most suitable that it could be apart from this it could be at, at the ground level or it could be at some height let it be 10 meters or it could be at 5 meters. So, these are the conditions we will have to define. The next one is we will have to specify the tolerable limits on decision years which will be used on the as the basis for establishing the quantity and quality of data. Means, we will have to specify or we will have to define the tolerable limits as far as suppose we will have we have already defined that it is a daily data. So, what could be the tolerable limits? I mean, if it is plus minus some microgram per meter cube, so then we will have to because as we as the condition is more closer to uh, <coughs> as far as time is concerned, suppose it is data, it is sorry, suppose it is uh, everyday data. So, uh, the tolerable limits could be even more. If it is weekly data, the tolerable limits will not be that much, but it will be little lesser. If it is monthly data or if it is annual data, the tolerable limits should be minimum. So, as the we are going closer in the time frame, we will have this tolerable limits increases. If we go further in uh, time frame like annual or weekly or monthly, this tolerable limit 
decreases. So the next one is we will have to specify the tolerable limits. Now, what are apart from these if we have defined or we have <coughs> uh, <coughs> determined these uh, things then our next aim is to determine the quality. So, how we can determine the quality for that we have some indicators. There are three major although there are many uh, indicators they are approximately 10 or 12 that we will discuss but there are three major indicators that actually define the <coughs> quality. So, they are known as quality indicators, they are precision, bias and detection limit. What is precision? Precision as far as definition is concerned, it is a measure of agreement among repeated measurements of the sum property under identically or identical or substantially similar condition. In fact, this is the random component of error. Precision is estimated by various statistical techniques typically using some derivative derivations of the standard deviation. It means the first one as far as definition is concerned, suppose we are monitoring air quality, <coughs> we have obtained some data, some result, let it be some x microgram per meter cube as far as particulate matters are concerned. So, if we repeat the same in more or less the similar condition, after some times we again anticipate that the result should be x microgram per meter cube. If it is not, I mean if it is deviating up to certain limit then it is fine because if it is within our error then it is fine if it is beyond if it is going beyond that then we will say that there is some trouble. I mean it means that the data is not precise and one more thing I would like to say that this precision is basically the random component of error. What happens? <coughs> there are two type of errors. One is random component of error, another is systematic error. Random error is basically a kind of error which can occur by chance. It is not certain, it is not defined, it is not fixed that this will happen and particularly at this time. This can happen by chance anytime, anywhere else. But the systematic error is not that more or less it is defined, it is certain. Systematic error is mainly caused by the instrument or by the technique what we are adopting. If there is a some trouble in the instrument, it means the chances are there that we will have systematic error. And this precision, uh, this uh, random error is generally occur by chance. <coughs> and if the errors are occurring, so we will have to fix that whether error is tolerable or within our control or not. And how we can do it? For that we apply, many, there are many statistical techniques with the help of that we can uh, <coughs> determine that this uh, precision error is within the tolerable limit or not or if it is beyond the tolerable limit then we will have to look for the source from where that error is coming. The next one is bias. Bias is basically the systematic error, it is a component which actually it is because of the I told you it is because of the system or because of the instrument. So, what happened? This <coughs> distortion is basically a kind of distortion, distortion which is generally persistent. So, it is it is happen, it is bound to occur. So, what we will have to do? We will have to look for the component or the system from where this type of error is coming and from there we can rectify that problem. <coughs> And in fact, bias will be determined by estimating the positive and negative deviation. This bias since it is frequent, it is bound to happen. So, it could be either positive or it could be either negative. Means I told you taking an example that the suppose that <coughs> the concentration of air pollutant or the particulate matter is coming x microgram per meter cube. It means if there is a bias error, so it is this <coughs> instrument is bound to give an error or a concentration which should be either lower, it should be x minus something or it should be x plus something. So, we will have to find out whether it is x minus means it is giving the lower value or it is giving the higher value. If it is giving the lower value, then we will have to have some corrective measures. Similarly, if it is giving uh, higher value, again we will have to have the some corrective measure by in the first case or the former case, we will have to add in the later case, we will have to subtract by a fixed amount or we will have to rectify the instrument. The next one is detection limit. Detection limit can be defined as the lowest concentration or amount of the target analyte that can be determined to be different from 0 by a single measurement at a stated level of probability. Now, so <coughs> how this detection limit 
can be determined. I mean detection limit is the least count of any instrument or of any process. So, what we will have to do first of all this detection limit has to be distinguished from 0. I mean it, it, it is not to be 0, it is more than 0. Now, the next step is we will have to make we will have to make certain standards with sequentially decreasing concentration and it should be below the fixed amount. Suppose we <coughs> the instrument what we are using has some detection limit let it be 0 0.1 uh, microliter 0 0.1 mic <coughs> ppm or 0 0.1 microliter. So, what, what will happen if we will have to determine the detection limit, uh, limit or we will have to if we have to verify the detection limit, what should we do? We will have to make standards that should be more than 0 0.1 ppm and it should be less than 0 0.1 ppm. Suppose we have make, made around 6 different standards. Then next one is what we will have to do? First of all, we will have to, <coughs> uh, we'll have to this uh, here it is given. Uh, this different 6 solutions are made which is uh, in this particular case it is not 0 0.1, but it is 0 0.01 microgram per liter. So, what we have done we have made 6 different standards that is 0 0.06 microgram per liter, 0 0.04, 0 0.02, 0 0.01, 0 0.005 and 0 0.003 microgram per liter cube. The fourth one is actually our presumed detection limit. We will have to confirm that this 0 0.01 is actually the least count or the lowest detection limit or not. So, the next step is this every I mean here every this standard has uh, has to be analyzed 6 times and we will get uh, not 6 times rather 7 times. So, <coughs> we will get different 7 results for each 6 standards and each 7 standards will have a mean and we will have a standard deviation. Suppose we have found the mean as 0 0.005 for the first one, 0 0.039 for the second one, 0 0.0022 for the third one, 0 0.011 for fourth one, 0 0.014 for fifth and 0 0.013 for the sixth one. Now, what we will have what we will have to do next is that we will have to run t-text between <coughs> uh, each subsequent uh, standards or the obtained mean values. Suppose now we will have to run t test between 1 and 2, 2 and 3, 3 and 4, 4 and 5, 5 and 6. So, what will happen if we run the t text between 1 and 2, we obtain some result, between 2 and 3, we obtain some result. So, the t result between 1 and 2 and between 2 and 3 will be different. Similarly, the t result between 2 and 3 and 3 and 4 will again be different. Similarly, between 3 and 4, 4 and 5. If it is not different, if these data are not statistically different, then we will say that the fourth one is the detection limit. Now, since we assume the detection limit as 0 0.01 and now we have finally found that actually the detection limit or the least count of the instrument is 0 0.011 microgram per liter. So, this is how we can determine the detection limit or we can determine the least count. So, it is written the same thing how we can determine the detection limit or we can determine the uh, <coughs> uh, least count. Apart from that, apart from these three I mean uh, precision, bias and uh, detection limit there are other 7 quality indicators their accuracy, completeness, comparability, representativeness, detectability blanks and replication. What is accuracy? Accuracy is basically a measure of the overall agreement of a measurement to a known value and includes a combination of random error and systematic error. I mean the precision and bias components of bus sampling and analytical operation. So, accuracy is basically we can say combination of precision and bias. If there is no random mirror I mean if the result is precise similarly if the result is not biased then we will say the data or the result what we are obtaining is accurate. Now, here it is given how the precision is because many a times we uh, confuse precision 
to be accurate. I mean they are supposed to be same things but precision and accuracy are different actually. Here it is beautifully presented in uh, figures. In the first one we will say uh, we are seeing we have four data and we see that different all the four data are in the outer circle. They are close together. So, we will say here that the result is precise but not accurate. It means the repeatability is there. So, whatever the result we are getting from the instrument or from the technique or from the system, we are getting the same result again and again. It means the result is precise, but these four data are not towards the center. They are far off from the, uh, from the center. It means although the result is precise, but it is not exactly what we anticipate. I mean repeatability is there, but the result is not what we are supposed to get. So, it is not accurate. In the second one, we are seeing all the four data are scattered, they are not together, but they are closer to the central point. It means that they are approaching what we are expecting. I mean the result what we are getting is anticipated result, but they are not more or less same. So, we will say they are although accurate, but they are not precise. In the fourth one, they are together and they are in the center. It means the repeatability, repeatability is there. I mean the data what we are obtaining, it is same again and again and it is closer to the anticipated data. So, we can say here that the result, our result is precise as well as it is <coughs> accurate. Now, what is, what could be the relationship between precision and accuracy? Precision and accuracy are, are estimate of random and systematic error in a measurement process. They provide an estimate of total error or uncertainty associated with an individual measurement. Precision is measured by repeated analysis of a single sample, whilst accuracy is an indication of how closely the measurements match true concentration of a sample. Now, <coughs> the next one is completeness. What is completeness? Basically, completeness describes the amount of valid data obtained from a measurement system compared to the amount that was expected to be obtained under correct normal conditions. For example, if we are monitoring PM 2.5 and <coughs> that is designated to sample every 6 day, I mean suppose we are monitoring every 6 day for PM 2.5. So, in a month we will get around <coughs> 5 data. Every 6 day in 30 days it means 5 data. Suppose any, uh, suppose for some reasons we miss one monitoring. I mean out of 5 expected monitorings we did only 4 monitorings. So, we say that we have obtained 80 percent of the anticipated data. So, now our aim is their circumstances, their conditions which can define that whether this 80 percent data is complete or not. If anyhow this 80 percent data, I mean 4 data can represent the entire 5 data, I mean entire month's data, then we will say if the monitoring is 80 percent, it is complete. I mean the monitoring is complete. If it is, if we anyhow have missed four, uh, 2 monitorings, it means we have done 60 percent monitoring and for some reasons that 60 percent if it does not represent the entire month's data or if entire month's air pollution or PM 2.5 uh, concentration, then we will say that 60 percent is not the complete data. So, now our result should be at least we will have to monitor 80 percent of the time. So, we should have 80 percent in a month of total data and that will be the that can be considered as the complete data. Now, the next one is comparability. Comparability is measure of the confidence with which one data set or method can be compared to another considering the units of measurement and applicability to standard statistical techniques. Comparability of data set is critical in evaluating their measurements, uncertainty and usefulness. What does it mean actually? Comparability will suppose <coughs> we are obtaining some data by some process and we are obtaining the same data by another process. If they are compared and they are found to be identical to a large extent, it means that there is a comparability in data. I mean data are not fake or not wrong. The next one is representativeness. 
Representativeness is the degree to which the data accurately and precisi precisely represent the environmental attributes of interest. A representative sample requires that the sample site be reflective of the study population of interest. For example, suppose <coughs> Delhi is a bigger city and suppose it is not possible that if we are monitoring air pollution or PM 2.5, we can monitor air, uh, monitor air pollutant or PM 2.5 every 100 meters or 50 meters because it is aerially uh, uh, very, very extended. So, we will have to find out some places from where the data can represent the exact Delhi. I mean, if we are monitoring somewhere at ITU, we can now we will have to check whether this the PM 2.5 concentration of ITO can exactly represent the pollution level or PM 2.5 level of Delhi or not? Certainly not because ITO is highly polluted. If you are monitoring at some clean place, cleaner place and we have obtained some data and if we say that this data, whether this data can represent the Delhi's pollution or not? Certainly not because the data what we have obtained, the <coughs> it is from a very clean place. So, definitely it will be biased. So, we will have to find a place or we'll have to find a location or we'll have to find certain locations from where the obtained data can exactly represent the entire area. The next one is detectability. I think it is the same uh, <coughs> list count what we have discussed. The low critical uh, range value of characteristic that a method a specific uh, procedure can reliab reliably discern. Apart from uh, <coughs> what we have discussed, the <coughs> uh, uh, quality indicators, uh, there are some more things which are very important. Uh, uh, among, the, among them is blanks. Blanks are very important as far as monitoring of air pollution is concerned. What are blanks actually? Blanks are allocates of filter or samples without the analyte. I mean, we will have to take out the samples without monitoring. I mean, it should be totally blank or free from pollution so that we can exactly understand that whether this filter or the uh, sample what we are using for the monitoring of pollution is not contaminated in the beginning only. So, <coughs> now it is a solution containing little or no analyte of interest. Blanks are of three different types. One is filter blank second one is analytical blank and the third one is filled blank. What is filter blank? Filter blank is the aliquot of filter without sampling taken in a clean environment. So, <coughs> what we will have to do? We will have to take out a filter what we use for the sampling of PM 2.5 and we will have to analyze that particular filter in a same condition what we analyze the filters after sampling. Similarly, the analytical blank is the aliquot of solution in the proce process without the sample filter because for uh, the suppose we will have to do estimation of uh, metals. For that, we actually dissolve uh, the filters in some acids. Suppose these acids are having some contamination, contamination from the beginning, beginning only. Uh, so, we can get confused with the <coughs> contamination that was present in the solution is to be of atmosphere. So, to overcome that process, we will have to take out the solution or that is also known as analytical blank. This analytical could an analytes could be either acids, distilled water or anything. So, we will have to find whether these analytes or analytical things are free from pollution or not. The next one is filled blank. So, what in this particular case, what we will have to do? We will have to take out the uh, filter paper. We will have to keep a filter paper in the fill, but without putting it on the instrument, I mean without sampling, so that we can know if there is some contamination during transport that could be identified or that could be estimated. So, in this with this with the help of these three different blanks like filter blank, analytical blank, filled blank, we can exactly underst understand the exact amount of contamination that is present without monitoring or without sampling. And once they are determined, it has to be subtracted 
from the exact value what we are obtaining after the sampling. Then we will get exact scenario or exact condition of the PM 2.5 or whatever pollution parameters we are monitoring. Now, the next quality indicator is replication. Replication generally consists of two things, either two or three samples. I mean, <coughs> the replicated samples are collected at the same field site following the same collection procedures and as close as possible to the same time. The purpose of replicate sample is to document sampling and analytical precision. The result of replicated sample provide useful information regarding the overall ability of the field and laboratory program. Why this replication is important? We will have to replicate the sampling either twice or thrice. <coughs> if it is we are doing twice, then we will say that the data is duplicate. If it is three or thrice, then we will say the data is triplicate. This replication is done exactly in the same condition and exactly at the same time, but not always. Somehow, suppose we are taking uh, weekly sample for a month, so we will get four or five samples in a month. So, once or twice we will have to replicate the sample either in duplicate or triplicate. This is how we can be assured that the repetition is not biased or the repetition is free from any error. Now, what are the measurement uncertainties? Measurement uncertainties are the errors associated with the air quality data including errors associated with the field preparation and laboratory measurement phases. At each, each measurement phase errors can occur that in most cases are additive. Goal of quality assurance program should be to control measurement uncertainty to an acceptable level through the use of various quality control and evaluation techniques. For example, PM10 monitors provide the best estimate of overall measurement precision since it captures both the measurement uncertainty in the field and in the laboratory. Like, like in case of measurement uncertainty for automated ozone method, the goal of goal for acceptable measurement uncertainty is defined for precision as an upper 90 percent confidence limit for the coefficient of variance and 7 percent for uh, <coughs> 7 percent for bias as an upper 95 percent confidence limit for the absolute bias of 7 percent. Similarly, in case of PM10 or in case of particulate matters whether it is 10 or 2.5, the acceptable measurement of uncertainty is defined for precision as an upper 90 percent confidence limit for the coefficient of variance of 15 percent and for bias as an upper 95 percent confidence limit <coughs> for the absolute bias of 15 percent. Similarly, in case of uh, lead methods, the goal for acceptable measurement uncertainty is defined for precision as an upper 90 percent confidence limit for the coefficient of variance and of 20 percent and for bias uh, sorry variance of 20 percent and for bias as an upper 95 percent confidence limit for the absolute bias of 15 percent. Similarly, in case of nitrogen dioxide, the acceptable measurement uncertainty is defined for precision as an upper 90 percent confidence limit for the coefficient of variance of 15 percent and for bias as an upper limit of 95 percent confidence limit for the absolute bias of 15 percent. Similarly, for <coughs> sulfur dioxide, the acceptable measurement uncertainty for precision is defined as an upper 90 percent confidence limit for the coefficient of variance of 10 percent and for bias as an upper 95 percent confidence limit for the absolute bias of 10 percent. <coughs> now, apart from this, there is also one point quality control check for sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, ozone and carbon, carbon monoxide. In fact, a one point quality control check must be performed at least once every two weeks for each automated analyzer used for used to measure SO2, NO2, O3 and CO. The frequency of QC check must may be <coughs> reduced based upon review, assessment and approval of the nodal authority. So, these are the things what we have discussed earlier. It actually represents whether there is an error or there is a possibility of error in automated system or not. Because this confidence or coefficient of variations 
or fixed for the estimation of any persistent error and if the error is there what type of error is that and how I mean whether it is within the tolerable limit or not. If it is not within the tolerable limit we will have to solve that problem. So now <coughs> the next one apart from all this what we have discussed these were actually the informations or suggestions. The, uh, our nodal agency, uh, India's nodal agency for the monitoring of air pollution that is CPCB <coughs> has also fixed some guidelines for the quality assurance and quality check. There are in fact two types of or two levels of quality control. One is within laboratory quality check, another is between laboratory or inter laboratory quality check. Now, <coughs> what is within laboratory quality check? This uh, within laboratory quality check is first of all we will have to choose an analytical method that should be suitably free from bias and we, sh we, we must ensure the complete and unambiguous description of the method. Apart from that we will have to check that satisfactory precision is obtained with the method. The next one we will have to establish a control chart as a continuing check on precision and some source of bias. The last one is we will have to ensure accuracy of standard solution. So how it is done? First of all we will have to, we will have to adopt a, an analytical method. For example, we are monitoring air quality. Let it be uh, particulate matter. So, monitoring of particular matter involves many methods. It should be either gravimetric or it should be automated samplers. Suppose we are obtaining gravimetric method. So, <coughs> it has to be, I mean, this method has will have to ensure that this method is totally unambiguous. I mean, there is no problem either in the process or in the instrument. Next one is we will have to estimate whether this method or monitoring of particular matter is precise. I mean it should, should it is if it is free from errors or not. Afterwards we will have to set up a control chart. Control chart means what methods we are applying or what, what, what methods should be there for future um, um, <coughs> monitorings. The next one is we will have to compare the calibrations of standard solution and finally we will have to check the inter laboratory biases. I mean if this, this the last one is basically uh, intra laboratory not within laboratory it is uh, inter laboratory uh, method. So first five are in the laboratory or it has to be observed inside, inside the lab, uh, laboratory while the last one is between the two or many different laboratory. In the first one like analytical method we can see here it is basically dependent upon the selection of the methods while the last five are testing of applications of the methods. <coughs> now, now next one is how between the laboratory or inter laboratory quality check can be performed. To test for possible biases caused by source sources not already checked in within the laboratory quality check and to provide direct evidence that the required comparability of result between laboratories has been achieved. Now <coughs> what we will have to do? Suppose we have obtained a result from any laboratory or any nodal laboratory. So our next aim is to we will have to fo follow the same process and same method to be adopted in a different laboratory and we have got another result from the other laboratory. Now we will have to check the, the results what we have obtained in first laboratory or the nodal laboratory is basically coincident with the results that we have obtained from the other laboratory or not. If it is not I mean then we can say there is some problem either in the first laboratory or in the second laboratory and we will have to rectify it. <coughs> now, the next one is inter laboratory proficiency, proficiency testing of ambient air quality <coughs> measurement. 
the first, first of all, we will have to determine the performance of individual laboratories for specific tests or measurements and to monitor laboratories continuing performances. Afterwards, we will have to identify the problems in laboratories and initiate remedial actions which may be related to for example, individual stop performance or calibration of the instrument. The third one is we will have to establish the effectiveness and comparability of new test or measurements methods and similarly to monitor established methods. If we have found out the errors, we have found out the problems, what should be our next step? Next is we will have to provide additional confidence to laboratory clients, we will have to identify inter laboratory differences, we will have to <coughs> determine the performances, performance characteristics of a method often known as collaborative trials. And finally, we will have to assign values to reference materials that is also known as RMs and assess their suitability for use in a specific test or measurement procedures. Now, <coughs> what type of proficiency testing we can adopt or we can observe? First of all, we will have to do measurement comparison schemes, then interlaboratory testing scheme and afterwards the finally we will have to do split sample testing scheme. We will discuss <coughs> this later on. First of all, we will have to see what should be the infrastructure for conducting interlaboratory comparison on ambient air quality methods. The primary requirement for conducting interquality laboratory comparison on physical and chemical methods for measurement of air pollutant is known as ring test. It is mainly consists of several mass flow meters of different flow capabilities. A mass flow controller, regu uh, controller regulates these mass flow meters. Provision for producing the dilute air is done by means of a compressor. Here <coughs> is basically the uh, schematic of uh, ring test facility. Basically this uh, ring test uh, facility is, uh, is a kind of generator which actually gives us the fixed concentration of fixed amount of pollutants or the gases which we observe in uh, a polluted environment. It could be nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide or carbon monoxide. Suppose with the help of this ring test facility, uh, we have obtained any particular gas and now because this ring test facility is a very robust method for giving us the specific or fixed amount of concentration of any particular gas. So, now we will have a cons uh, <coughs> gas of known concentration and this known concentration can be used for the determining uh, for determining the proficiency of any particular lab. Now, <coughs> how it can be done uh, uh, with the help of ring test facility? The standard gas uh, mixtures produced by ring test facility are made available to different participants through a gas tube or interlaboratory comparison exercises. Now, afterwards, in fact, there are three different methods for determining the concentration. One is choice of method process, I mean they are free to adopt the choice, whatever the choice, whatever the method for determining that particular concentration they can adopt. The next one is a specified or assigned value they are supposed to uh, determine and once it is determined and if we observe some kind of error then that has to be tested statistically. Now, what are uh, the benefits of interlaboratory testing? First of all, it actually provides an objective means of assessing and <coughs> demonstrating the reliability of the data they are producing. Second one, laboratories can claim that they can perform testing competently. It supplements laboratories own internal quality control procedures by providing an additional external audits of the testing capability. And the last one is laboratories can prove their testing capabilities to users that results produced by them are reliable. Now, what are the reasons for poor quality of data? First one, irregular calibration, I mean the equipment are supposed to be regularly calibrated because we often do not uh, don't do it and this is one of the major reason for getting the poor quality data. The next one is improper sample collection, we actually do not follow the stipulated or 
uh, <coughs> fixed methods for the collection of data and this is also one of the major reasons for the poor quality uh, data. And the third one is preservation. The samples should be preserved in a very uh, <coughs> sanitated environment. It should be preserved properly. Otherwise, the chances are there that we will not get the expected or <coughs> reliable quality of re reliable type of data. Uh, fourth one is transportation. During transportation, uh, transportation, there is possibility of error or there is also possibility that the data should be should not be uh, cannot be free from errors. So, the chances of getting error into the data is more and the last one is during the analytical processes or analysis. During analysis also, also if we are not observing the fixed or standard methods the chances are there that again we can get the poor quality of data. Apart from that there are many other reasons one is uh, the lack of trained manpower if the man or the <coughs> person who is handling the data or who is doing the experiments if they are not trained the chances are there that the data cannot be proper or good quality. Apart from that the <coughs> improper, improper location of monitoring stations, monitoring stations should also be properly located so that the data should be free from errors. Apart from that lack of infrastructure is also one of the major reasons, lack of dedicated manpower and non-availability of continuous power supply. Electricity is also a major problem which is one of the major reason for the poor quality of data. Now, what are this, uh, what could be the remedial measures for or uh, what could be uh, <coughs> the uh, methods for the improvement? Uh, first of all, we will have to calibrate the equipment, we will have to calibrate our equipments regularly. That is one of the most important part and during sample collection, we will have to be ultra careful. Apart from this, we will have during transportation, during analysis, we will have to be again very, very careful. Otherwise, these are the things where the chances of getting error is very, very much. Now, the next one is analytically, we will have to control or the <coughs> analyte should be good, uh, uh, a good quality. Apart from that, the manpower should be trained. Infra infrastructure is also a major requirement for uh, having good quality of data. If <coughs> these are done, then we will have to do review meetings regularly so that these errors, once if we have we have made ourselves free from errors, it should not be repeated. And <coughs> apart from that, the involvement of other monitoring agencies are also very, very important to overcome the chances of having error data. Dedicated manpower and continuous power supply are also of paramount importance. If these are there, the chances are there that we will get data which are totally error free. Now, finally, I can say that there are many types of quality assurance and quality checks and a variety of ways to evaluate the reliability of data collected from a particular project. In the absence of such quality assurance and quality control analysis, it is impossible to determine whether the collected data can be can meet the <coughs> project objectives or not. So, with this, I think I end the, this particular topic today. And thank you very With much. With this note, thank you, sir. Thank you so very much uh, for delivering such a nice lecture and explaining us in detail about the quality assurance and uh, quality control. Uh, so, uh, this quality assurance and quality control is uh, more likely to be applied in the metropolitan cities uh, or uh, it is uh, applied in the areas which are semi-urban areas. I mean, everywhere because I told you, uh, yes, uh, there are different type of errors. One is uh, <coughs> systematic error, another is random error. So, this, uh, if we are uh, applying it in uh, more, uh, metropolitan uh, 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 cities, the chances of both the errors are very, very much because there are many factors that could be responsible for the errors here. But as far as the semi-urban or rural areas are concerned, the chances of systematic error is more there rather than the random error because uh, the instrumental problem if uh, instrument is faulty. So, uh, whether we are monitoring in semi-urban area or urban area, the chances of getting faulty data is equally uh, uh, equal at both the places. But here in metro cities because of uh, many factors like we have so many numbers of vehicles, population is very, very much. So, other parameters like wind velocity, wind direction, etcetera, we cannot be so precise as we will be precise 
in case of semi urban area. So, the chances of uh, random error uh, in the metropolitan area areas are more than that of uh, semi urban areas. Uh, many times in the newspaper nowadays we see uh, that uh, there is a column which indicates uh, uh, it uh, regularly updates that is the quality uh, QA and the QC um, of this the cities is this and uh, recently uh, I read in the newspaper also in one of the leading newspapers that uh, uh, if when we talk about these uh, Delhi. Uh, the quality control or the quality check, it appears to be higher. I mean, the pollution is a higher. So, what is the reason? Reason is the same uh, as the pollution in the cities very much? Yes, yes. Pollution in the cities are naturally Delhi is highly polluted. And <coughs> apart from that, because, you know, uh, this, uh, uh, the results what we are getting, if we do not apply this quality check and quality assurance properly, the results will be biased whether it is for the reporting purposes or it is for the research purposes. So, the anticipated or the result what we are, what we are actually expecting to happen or if we are uh, collecting the data for some purpose, that purpose will not be fulfilled. So, quality assurance and quality check during the monitoring of air pollution is very, very important. Although it is important in reporting, but if it is for the research purposes, it is, uh, uh, it is, it becomes, its importance, I mean, increases many folds. Uh, so, thus we can say that uh, during the season, that is the festival season such as of Diwali, uh, this uh, quality control or the quality check uh, parameter would be very beneficial for us uh, in uh, measuring the uh, yes, pollution yes. of Every the cities. I mean, uh, for that, we, what we have to do, it is not that, since the monitoring is a continuous process, but this uh, method of uh, checking quality and assuring quality is not that regular phenomena. Once in a month or once in two weeks, a fortnight, we will have to fix a day or date that at f that, uh, that particular uh, day or date, we will have to check our instruments, we will have to check our procedures or the persons who are involved in the monitoring, they are doing it properly or not. So, once it is done, we are now, I mean, free, I mean, we are not burdened. Now, for a month or so, we will do continuous monitoring and the whatever the data we are obtaining are of supposedly good quality. Uh, it is also seen that uh, particularly in the um, urban, uh, rural uh, cities, rural areas, um, the big companies, uh, uh, places or plants, they are industrial uh, factories over there. Uh, do you think so? Uh, there uh, one is required to have this kind of parameter for controlling or checking? Yes, yes. Every year, wherever the monitoring is going on, whether it is, I mean, big industries or nodal agencies which are responsible for the monitoring of air, everywhere the quality control and quality assurance should be observed. Otherwise, the data we are getting will be faulty if it is in negative direction. I mean, <coughs> if it is giving the results uh, lower than the exact one, then again it is wrong. I mean, <coughs> we will have underestimate of the pollution level. If we are, if this uh, result is biased towards the plus side, I mean, if it is giving more result, what, uh, what should exactly be, then again we will say that now we are overestimating the uh, result. So, that is again a problem and people can, can be panicked that the pollution although it should be it is expected to be this much, but it is coming that much. So, it is a problem for the common man and even for the agencies too. So, the regular uh, checks of the instruments, checks of the procedures, checks of the results are mandatory. Otherwise, the results what we are obtaining uh, will be of not much use. Definitely, it is our corporate social responsibility for all the companies who, who, who places their uh, plants um, in the urban or the rural areas. It is their responsibility uh, to get their equipment checked as well as one need to get their uh, vehicles checked from time to time if we want to have a pollution-free environment around us so that <coughs> we can breathe easily and our generations could have healthy life. Thank you, sir. Thank you so very much uh, for being the part of the ADC lecture. Thank you.